Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to continue our study of the book of Acts. Thank you for being with us, and I hope you enjoy our study today. We're going to be reading Acts chapter 9, and it deals with the conversion of Saul of Tarsus from a persecutor among the Jews to a faithful Christian defender of the gospel of Christ. In verse 1 of Acts chapter 9, We are told, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul was first introduced to us at the stoning of Stephen in the previous chapter. And so now he is continuing as a major player in the persecution of the Christians by the Jews in the city of Jerusalem. You will notice that in our text he was asking for letters to go to Damascus and these letters would apparently authorize him to go into the synagogues and seek out Christians that might be there. In Acts 22, at verses 4 and 5, we read, I persecuted this way to the death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the counsel of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there, to Jerusalem to be punished. It was a massive effort on his part, and he had authorization to persecute those who were Christians physically, to bind them and to bring them to Jerusalem if they were following what is called here the way. You know, Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that must have stuck in the minds of many of the brethren as they became identified with the way, the way being followers and believers in Christ. It must have been satisfying to Saul and to the other Pharisees when the church was scattered. But that satisfaction was short-lived. They heard that the disciples had gone everywhere and going to other places, they were preaching the word and leading others to be followers of this Jesus. So Saul requested permission to go after them. He was violently opposed to Christianity, apparently almost obsessed with stopping this movement called Christianity. Damascus was about 120 miles northeast of Jerusalem. It's the oldest continually populated city in the world today. Well, the letters were meant to authorize Paul to arrest Jewish Christians and return them to Jerusalem. This authorization was not really for execution of these Christians, but extradition of them bringing them back to Jerusalem. 
The letters might or might not carry any legal authority outside of Israel itself. Depending on the sentiments of the Roman king Aretas, Aretas would cooperate so that Christians would not cause trouble and so that there would be no issue with the Jewish high priest Caiaphas back in Jerusalem. This is the first city outside Israel where Christians are noted and identified. Hellenist Christians may have scattered to Damascus and shared the gospel with the sizable Jewish population there, and so there was a threat of growth among Christians who were Jews in that city. The high priest was Joseph Caiaphas in these events, and that, and they apparently occurred about 34 or 35 A.D. The high priest, as we have said many times already, was the presiding officer of the Sanhedrin Council, and so the authorization letters came from the high priest and from the council. Thus the power of the highest Jewish authority was behind Paul's efforts to wipe out Christianity. Outside Israelite territory in Syria, where Damascus was, Paul would have to seek help from those in the Jewish synagogues to find the Christians. We read some further details in Acts chapter 26 at verse 9, when Paul speaks to King Agrippa. We'll come to that in our study a little later. But read for now where Paul says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. You see why we say that Paul, Saul, at that time, was obsessed with stopping the movement called Christianity, called by them at that time, the way. Well, back to verse 3 of our text in Acts 9. As he journeyed, Paul, Saul, came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. This event is recorded three times in the book of Acts, once here in Acts chapter 9, one, once in Acts chapter 22, and once in Acts chapter 26. In Acts 22, verse 6, Saul says, Now it happened, as I journeyed and came near, near Damascus, at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around about me. In Acts 26, he expands on it a little further and says, While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me 
and those who journeyed with me. The original word that is used here indicates an instantaneous flash or a flashing light. That's what he saw as he approached Damascus. You can see Damascus north of Jerusalem on this map. This is a more modern map and shows Israel and Damascus to the north of Israel on the east end of the Mediterranean Sea. Well, Saul fell to the ground, we are told, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The goads were pointed sticks that would be used to move the animals, the sheep, from one place to another. In Acts chapter 27, uh, 22, verse 7, Saul says, I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Acts 26 adds a couple of details when it says, When we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, "You, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Notice in each case, the name Saul is duplicated. The double naming Saul, Saul, indicates intensity and urgency. In these three passages, it is the same the rendering of the words of the Lord are identical. Saul's conversion brought his mission to find and hurt Christians to an immediate end. He ran into a roadblock that was set up by Jesus himself on the way to Damascus. Well, in verse 6, Luke tells us that he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul tells this himself. Later, in Acts chapter 22 at verse 10, he says, So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. Of course, Saul will be told to change sides immediately in the dispute between Jews and Christians. He will also be commissioned to promote the other side, the side of the Christians as they went forward. This message is repeated in Acts chapter 26 and expounded upon when he says to Agrippa that he was told to rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you 
for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So Saul was told to go into the city, and it would be told him what he must do specifically. But here, in Acts 26, Paul tells Agrippa that he received his basic commission from the Lord while still on the road to Damascus after having seen the light. Interesting that such is the case. Well, the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, Luke says, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Saul later explains, those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Notice Saul sees and hears the full glory of the Lord. To hear sometimes means to audibly hear sounds with the ears. Sometimes, as here, it means to comprehend. Apparently, they heard a voice, but those accompanying Saul did not comprehend the words spoken by the voice. Luke says, they heard a voice, but they saw no one. And Paul later says, they did not hear the voice, that is, they did not understand or comprehend what the voice was saying to Saul. Well, verse 8 tells us then, Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He was apparently blinded by this. He says in Acts 22, And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. We are told then in verse 9, He was three days without sight. He was blinded and he neither ate nor drank. The blindness was a sign. This was not so much a judgment as it was a sign to him, and a giving him a time to meditate, to reflect, to fast, perhaps to repent, and to prepare to hear the Lord's messenger when he came. Now that messenger was a man named Ananias. There was a certain disciple, Luke tells us, at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias? And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in 
and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Ananias is, of course, a Jewish believer in Christ, a preacher of the gospel in this case, to tell Saul of Tarsus God's word. And notice that we are told the very street on which Ananias was to go to find Saul. God is specific and very careful in leading the way to this situation. Well, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Apparently, the word had gotten out in Damascus that Saul was on his way and that he would persecute the Christians there. Notice Ananias says, And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Well, Ananias was nervous about going to this known enemy of his new faith, this new enemy, Saul. He seems to question the instruction, almost balking at it at first. We should never try to decide, however, whether one is a fit subject to listen to the gospel of Christ. And that was the case with Saul of Tarsus. In this case, however, there may have been some fear of personal injury by Ananias. Certainly that would be understandable, wouldn't it, if we were in the same circumstances that he was. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Saul did not preach just to the Gentiles, but he had a primary mission to preach to them. He would preach also to the Israelites, He would go into their synagogues first in every city where he went and give them the opportunity to obey the gospel. But their refusal would lead him to then turn to the Gentiles. The Lord said, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Saul, who became Paul, would be persecuted himself and ultimately apparently martyred for the cause of Christ. He is called here a vessel. He is a chosen vessel of mine, Jesus says. This vessel is a person, a person with a certain function, and a proposed role to carry out for the Lord. He would go primarily to the Gentiles, as we said. Well, Ananias went his way and entered the house where he had been sent. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 22, Paul tells it this way, Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony, with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. 
and at that same hour I looked up at him. And then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one, that's Christ, and hear the voice of his mouth. It was God who sent Christ to speak to Saul on the road out there toward Damascus. He says, For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. He would be a witness to that event on the road and the words of Jesus to him and the vision of seeing the Lord as he began his apostolic function. Well, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. Ananias, of course, had laid his hands on him so that he would receive his sight. And he received his sight at once, Luke tells us. And he arose and was baptized. In Acts chapter 22 at verse 16, Saul tells what Ananias said to him to cause him to be baptized. He said, Now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We need to do exactly that if we have not been baptized into Christ. We need to arise. We need to get up from any despair, any other cause, and be baptized into Christ, not letting anything keep us from the kingdom of God. And wash away your sins. That is the purpose of the baptism. Washing away our sins occurs when we are baptized. You'll remember Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. When he did that, Saul of Tarsus called on the name of the Lord. Notice that Saul is baptized immediately upon hearing that he should do that. In doing so, he committed to Jesus Christ. Well, when he had received food, he was strengthened. And then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately, he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Saul, we will see, is unafraid to go back among the very people that he had been persecuting. What a good spirit, a brave spirit, a bold spirit on his part. Then all who heard were amazed. And they said, Is this not he who was who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. We will see, as we go forward in the text, how Saul spent time in Damascus. Then he left and went to Arabia for a time, and then returned to Damascus before going to Jerusalem after three years. Luke says, verse 23, 
Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. He is in Damascus still at this time. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. Paul told the Corinthians later in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 at verse 32, In Damascus, the governor, under Aretas the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Well, Saul will tell a little more about his preaching the gospel and about his travels before going into the Asia Minor territories. In Galatians chapter 1, at verse 15, he says, When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him fifteen days. After his conversion, it was some time before he went to preach the gospel. Here we have a term, three years, that describes some of this period in Paul's life. Well, when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. We might say they were still afraid of him even after this time, and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus, So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. Of course, in Jerusalem, Saul was met with skepticism. They remembered what he had done earlier in persecuting them and their loved ones and their fellow Christians in Jerusalem and elsewhere. Suppose you were a relative of Stephen and a member of the Jerusalem church. Would you have been skeptical of this one coming? Or maybe you were a relative of some other Christian that had been hurt by Saul. What would your attitude be? Would you still be angry at him? Well, Barnabas steps in as a mediator. Barnabas knew of Saul's commitment to Christ, his conversion, his change of heart and change of life, and he steps in to help Saul with the brethren. Well, Saul spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and he disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. 
the Hellenists, of course, were refusing to accept Christ. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. When they found out about the plot to kill Saul, they now were willing to to try to help save him. They brought him to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Tarsus was Saul's hometown. It was a logical place for him to go. We might ask, however, when he went, what about his family? Saul's family were Jews, and they had sent him to Jerusalem to learn more about the, the Jewish way and to be a leader among Jews. If they were still living, do you think they would have received him as a Christian, being Jewish, no doubt having sacrificed to send him to Jerusalem for training under Gamaliel in the best of Jewish schools? How would they feel about his conversion? We have to ask ourselves, were they converted to Christ themselves? Well, we're not told, are we? Nor are we told if he ever returned to Tarsus after going there this time. Tarsus, of course, was the major city in Cilicia. It was a center of commerce and education. Tarsus was a residence of a Roman governor, and people born there were given Roman citizenship. Paul will later call upon that Roman citizenship to help him in a diff difficult situation with a Roman soldier. Well, then all the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, had peace and were edified. Notice, once again, we're looking at growth in the church in Judea, in Galilee, and Samaria. At this time, all Christians are Jews but the gospel is being spread outside the city of Jerusalem. According to our theme statement, back in verse 8 of chapter 1, which stated that the disciples, the apostles, would be witnesses to Christ in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the disciples were multiplied, verse 31 tells us. Again, let's remember how often in the book of Acts we come back to these statements that perhaps at times we read over very quickly without much thought but are expressive of the fact that the gospel is being spread and showing us how it is being spread. You might note that the word churches in our New King James Version here is singular in the original text. Thus, the word is church. The word ecclesia is used sometimes in the singular for the general sense of the word church. More often, of course, in the book of Acts and throughout the Gospels, in the congregational sense or the local sense, it can be seen in the plural. In the New Testament, Luke has said nothing until now about the church in Galilee, but here he mentions that the gospel is being spread in the northernmost region 
of Israel, as well as in Judea and in Samaria. Well, it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. This is our first reference to Peter since Acts chapter 8, verse 25. And you will notice that he is traveling through all parts of the country. Peter apparently did not stay in Jerusalem very long, but is now moving out of the city. He has been preaching in and around Jerusalem. In these areas, other parts of the country. That is going to be illustrated in our next story here. He came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda and worked with them. Lydda was about 18 to 20 miles northwest of Jerusalem. It was about 8 to 10 miles southeast of Joppa. You can see Lydda on this map between the city of Jerusalem on the lower side of the map and Joppa on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Well, there at Lydda, he found a certain man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. Peter's first miracle, you remember, in Acts chapter 3 was healing a crippled man. Here he will perform two miracles in our chapter, Acts chapter 9. One is a man, and the other will be a woman. Well, let's remember now that this man, Aeneas, is paralyzed. He's been bedridden for eight years. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon, a neighboring region, saw him and turned to the Lord. The phrase, make your bed, is literally spread for yourself. This the man could now do, and it would prove that he was no longer paralyzed. He could spread his bed, take it up, we might say. Do it for himself without others having to do it for him. He could now do this, and it would be proof that he was no longer paralyzed. Notice in this text, Peter gives credit to Jesus again for the miracles that he does. He gives credit to Jesus for this healing. Healing was a great miracle, but the apostles were seeking really to bring people to Jesus for the healing of their spirits, for the healing of their souls, and that was much more important. Peter does not take credit for the miracle. Well, we move on to Joppa. At Joppa, on the coast of the Mediterranean, as you remember the map, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. Joppa is the modern seaport city 
of Jaffa, Israel. In Old Testament times, it was a seaport, commercial center, even in those days. You remember Jonah fled to Joppa to board a ship and escape to Tarshish. Joppa is on the Mediterranean sea coast, so Jonah embarked from Joppa, headed to the far end of the Mediterranean Sea. Here is a picture of the old city, Joppa. Humorous statue erected there in the old city of Jonah's big fish is seen in this photograph. The modern port city of Jaffa is an interesting, very modern, up-to-date city these days. Well, Tabitha is a Hebrew name. It means deer or gazelle, and it suggests a graceful person. Translated into Greek, it becomes Dorcas. So her name was Tabitha, or, in the Greek language, Dorcas. This woman was full of good works, charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and she died. When they had washed her, as was customary for the women to do to the dead, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there, and they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Now there's no record of an apostle raising the dead prior to this time but they obviously believed that the power of God was with Peter and that she could be raised from the dead. Well, Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him to the upper room and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. There was lots of weeping for those greatly needed in the church, those who were faithful and active workers, doing good deeds, accomplishing much for the cause of Christ in their own personal ways. Certainly there was weeping for people like that who were no longer with the church. Well, Peter put them all out, and he knelt down and he prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then she gave her, he gave her his hand, and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. This story reminds us of an event in Jesus' life with the raising of Jairus' daughter, found recorded in Mark chapter 5. Peter was there. There, Jesus said, Talitha kumi, little girl, arise. Here, Tabitha kumi, Tabitha, gazelle, arise. Well, it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed 
on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, a tanner. Apparently this Simon was a believer, a Christian himself. A tanner took skins and worked with them in crafting from the leather of those skins. Tanners were considered unclean by the strict Jewish sectarians because they worked with dead animals. It must have been a rather thriving business, however, for this man in the city of Joppa. Here is a picture drawing of Simon's house there in Joppa. Well, this brings us to the end of our study for today. I hope you have a wonderfully blessed day today and that you'll look forward to our next class where we will read Acts 10 and chapter 11 and study from God's Word. These lessons are quite important, and what we will see next time is the conversion of the first Gentiles to the kingdom of God. Thank you for being with us.